we're going to need a lot of the data center capacity that Chase is building um, for the next one because uh, Daniel is going to come up uh, in a little bit. He's a founder and CEO of, of Slingshot. Uh, they're building the foundational model for mental health. Uh, many of you know that we care deeply about this space, mental health. We've been making investments for many years. You know, you've probably seen this in you know, many, many different AGMs that we've talked about. Um, and the problem is only getting worse, right? As something like you've seen all the stats, like one in five adults have reported uh, severe mental depression uh, over the past year. Uh, two out of th every three teenagers report uh, having a massive uh, depressive episode last, just last year. The Surgeon General just put out an advisory on the mental health of parents. And you know, so the demand continues to escalate with all the modern pressures, but the supply side has not caught up. The, the total number of Therapists has stayed stubbornly at the same rate, and like the demand in some cases is like thousand to one, ten thousand to one. So we absolutely cannot scale this with humans anymore. It's, it seems pretty obvious, but fortunately for us, for the first time, AI and LLMs have basically arrived at the right time to potentially solve this at scale. And so Daniel has been thinking about this problem for a long period of time, and uh, you know he's he studied both machine learning uh, at Imperial College in London, you know one of the top you know sort of like research institutions, as well as been thinking about how to improve people's connection to themselves you know, and to others as a post-grad researcher. And uh, you know, when he started Slingshot, you know, all, all the stars aligned uh, for him to basically go tackle this problem. And we feel like you know, he's the right founder to basically take on this problem at scale. Welcome, Daniel. Tell, tell us a little bit more about the Slingshot origin story, a little bit more about, I, I shared some stats on the on the crisis, but you probably are like you know tackling with this problem every day. So maybe yeah. give us some context before I ask you know more about the tech. Absolutely. Um, yeah. So Sandeep talked a little bit about my background. Um, I'm also the son of a psychologist and a social worker. Um, I, I did my first internship as a social worker. Um, I studied philosophy of psychology as an undergrad. So I've been very interested, obsessed with this problem for a long time. Um, yeah. I, I, we can all print out like statistics about what's going on with mental health, but I think it's kind of obvious that we're in you know, a crisis. Um, I think, you know, the, the situation has been changing. We have to acknowledge that. I think we also have to acknowledge a little bit as we go into the future that, um, you know, technology and AI is probably making this problem worse, not better to a large extent. Uh, and I think that gives us an obligation to, you know, have AI be part of the solution and not just part of the problem. Yeah. Uh, maybe talk a little bit about everybody has been realizing that the demand exists, but it kind of feels like the tech never existed. Like we've been trying to like solve this problem with chatbots, with other solutions, but pre LLM, like you know, almost everything seemed like a hacky thing that people tried because they were desperate. They could not get access to a therapist, and they tried chatting with something on Facebook or something else like that, and it didn't particularly work after a day or two. And yeah. finally, it feels like you know we're at a at a frontier point. Well, I think I think basically um, what what was shocking to me when I got started was there are a lot of a lot of really bad mental health apps, and they actually have really positive feedback and they do have an impact on people. Mm. And I think that's just a proof of how desperate people are. Um, but basically, I think the approach that everyone has taken in this space up until now has been, um, you have a psychologist that has an opinion on how to solve mental health. Um, usually it's CBT, but sometimes it's something else. And they say, if only people followed my approach, if only they knew the facts, we would solve mental health overnight. Um, and so most technology up until this point, whether it's been chatbots or something else, has been written by a psychologist at the helm with one opinion about what solves this problem that they want to expand to everyone. Um, that doesn't work, kind of to say the obvious. I think what we've, uh, when, when uh, my co-founder and I got started, we spent, um, uh, we, we spent a bunch of time, we spent uh, an hour a day every day um, meeting therapists just to understand how they thought about their job, how they help. Um, we met 100 therapists that way. And I think the main thing we learned was like there is no one size fits all solution and that's really obvious to anyone in the space. Um, fit really matters when it comes to helping people. Like you need to get help in the right way for you, which is not just kind of like about being culturally sensitive, but also individually sensitive about what works. Um, and so the top-down approach of kind of like write out systematically a set of rules isn't going to work. What we think will work is learning at scale about how a range of people can be helped in their own ways, and then to offer that in a really scalable way. So um, our approach has been we are uh, you know, shipping, it, shipping our model within an app, but at the core, what we're building is a model. We think that basically the model is what makes you know, the app good. The model is a function of its training data and the algorithms. Um, so that's kind of like our, our entire investment. We've built out our app to be privacy first. 
So that means that we don't collect any data unless people explicitly opt in to share their data. We've been really surprised that people are much more willing to share that data when they understand you know, that we are the trusted partner, that we're, uh, we're extremely focused on um, privacy because we need to be the trusted partner when we collect this kind of data. And we've had a lot of people that opt in to share their data, which helps us train our models under the kind of the thought process of I want to help more people like me. Um, so it's been basically, I would say the big difference in our approach to what's been done before has been a lot of it in the past has been um, you know, one approach to mental health, trying to scale it up. We've taken you know, an AI first approach um, you know, I have my opinions about mental health, but I'm you know, very much not a therapist, and I think it's very important for me to acknowledge I can have all that textbook knowledge and not be the one that's able to help people directly, which allows us to, I think, diversify and learn a range of ways to help people. And I think the last thing I would say here is um, there is the other kind of approach here right now, which is like the chat GPT, anthropic, out-of-the-box model approach. Um, and that's actually really cool. I mean, people love using chat GPT to help them with their mental health, but this isn't a problem that gets magically solved if you're not explicitly working on it. Um, and the reason why is that most companies in the AI space are focused on the big problem, which is AGI. Like, um, you know, if you're working on AGI, I can completely get why you'd want to work on that. If you want to work on a general purpose assistant, super worthwhile thing to do. But an assistant doesn't push back on you. Like an assistant works with you, you know, validates you. Um, and validation can be, can be harmful to perhaps say something non-obvious sometimes, but Again, any therapist would see that as obvious. Um, ChatGPT, you know, you, if you come to it with a problem, it will try to solve the problem as quickly as possible. That's not a mistake. That's literally what they're trying to do. The better it gets, the more it tries to solve your problem immediately. When it comes to human interactions where you help someone, you're optimizing for long-term trajectories. You might say something that actually makes the person you know, feel not uncomfortable for a minute, mm -hmm. you know, where they ask for advice and you say, I don't know, do you feel like you need advice from me? Something like that. You just would not see that from you know an out of the box, more like assistant style chatbot. Yeah, that that is a super important point. I think a lot of people don't appreciate that a lot of the LLMs are trained with specific reward models, and the reward model is like, am I being helpful to you or not, right? But like short term helpful might be long term harmful, right? When it comes to mental health and exactly. changing the persona of the underlying model is like just as important as like even training the data. So. I appreciate like you know you sharing that nuance because a lot of folks don't appreciate that. Talk a little bit more about the fact that like you need specific data for you to like train yeah. you know these models and like this data is not available for everybody. Yeah, I mean so we do have partnerships with OpenAI and Anthropic so we've gotten a close look at kind of like how they think about this space. They don't have this kind of data. We so our approach basically has been a give to get model, give to get partnership with behavioral health organizations that um, understand that they're not able to scale out their solutions. It's impossible. I mean, there are no massive mental health companies because there's no way to scale up a solution that relies solely on people. So these organizations, we've become kind of a trusted partner to, be, to build a consortium to say, you know, we will provide access to our models in exchange we're going to train, you know, in an extremely privacy and security centric way on your data that allows us to build one model for everyone. Um, companies like OpenAI don't want to go close to this because they're not trying to build this kind of application. They're trying to build a general purpose assistant. They've told us they're staying away from this data. Um, so I would say like the key thing when you're building an app like this, like I said, is the model. The model is the data. We've built out the largest data set of this kind, as far as we know, um, and like for purposes of training a model. And that we think ultimately is how we succeed. Could you talk a little bit about the business model of Slingshot in the future? I know like you're still in the <laughs> development phase right now and, and probably not thinking too much about commercialization, but yeah. how does it get big at scale? Do you want to go straight to the consumer? What rough price points are you thinking? Yeah, I mean, I think what's surprising about mental health is we think of it as healthcare. Uh, it's very different than healthcare in that about half of mental health spend is cash pay. Um, a lot of it is consumer. BetterHelp is a billion dollar revenue business now, entirely cash pay, entirely just consumers paying for therapy. It's about 90 bucks per session, about 360 bucks a month. Um, we think that, like consumers want to touch this directly. Um, we're going direct to consumer to start at least and ideally forever because we think it aligns incentives on the product side. It forces us to build a product that's actually valuable to people. Um, and we think people are used to paying you know, the Netflix size prices. So I think 10 to 20 bucks a month, Netflix, Spotify kind of as the comparison. Um, I mean, we think the market direct to consumer is huge. It's awesome. Uh, I know we only have a couple minutes left, but um, maybe talk a little bit about like, you know, you were a solo founder when you started Slingshot, but you did something super unusual. After the seed round, which was led by us, you ended up recruiting an equal co-founder 
you know, last year, and then you ended up like, you know, raising a Series A after that. Like, yeah. walk us through that journey. What made you make that change? You know, your experience of working with Felicis and, you know, yeah. everything else that has transpired since. I mean, I would just say first, um, you know, I met you um, on, you know, I, I remember when I met you before the seed, um, I had like a pitch deck ready to go. And you were like, look, I, I get the business model. I get the pitch. I just want to know why you're the right person to do this because, you know, you're like, I, I've thought about the space for a long time. You don't really need to convince me there, but I do want to know who you are. Um, and I appreciate that. I think Felicis, I have to say, has been unique for us in having such a founder-led mindset, which is to say both kind of like supporting founders, but also being founders and having a mindset of like, this is my fund, this is my money. I think one of the first things you said to me was like, um, we take all our money from organizations that do good for the world. So if you succeed, um, you're making money for organizations doing good for the world. If you lose it, you know, you're losing good people's money. Um, I think just on the same lines, I, I met Neil, uh, Neil Parikh, my co-founder was the founder of Casper before this. Um, he's amazing. I think the big challenge for me was as the tech guy, we needed to build out a, a data set. And I think that requires a huge amount of trust. Um, Neil's a really good person. I think when I met him, the, you know, it, obviously it's a tough choice to bring on a late stage co-founder and we already had a business and we were already, you know, moving. But I think um, when it comes to a massive problem, you know, you want to build something massive, you want to get it right. And I think, um, don't get me wrong, it wasn't an easy choice, but I think um, it's about in the same lens, like if you want the business to succeed, you got to do whatever it takes to succeed. This is a, a mission worth doing. And so it's worth doing at all costs, kind of. Completely subscribe to that. Really appreciate your time here. Thank you again, Daniel. Thank you.